Hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's event. This year the Communist Party of Ireland celebrates the 100th anniversary of its foundation. Since October 1921, the CPI has been involved in struggles against slum landlords, unemployment, poverty and around women's rights and equality. The CPI has also helped to build trade unions and tenants organisations and has played a central role in developing the civil rights demands in the struggle in the North. This struggle for national unity and to end British interference has always been a central political demand. Following this, the importance of political education has been a feature of the CPI down the decades. It was from this approach that the CPI established the James Connolly Memorial Lecture. Established in 2008, this annual lecture provides a platform for speakers from both home and abroad to address the key public issues and challenges facing working class movements and those struggling against imperialist domination. The goal of the Memorial Lecturer is to keep the political and theoretical legacy of James Connolly alive and also make it relevant to a new generation of left Republican and communist activists. We have had excellent speakers from Ireland as well as guest speakers from the USA, Venezuela, England, Portugal, Catalonia, Wales and Germany. We are delighted this year to have as our guest, Vijay Prashad. Vijay Prashad is an Indian historian and journalist. He is the executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. He's the chief correspondent for Globetrotter and a columnist for Frontline India. He is also the chief editor of Left World Books in New Delhi, has appeared in two films, Shadow World and uh, Two Meetings, and has authored 30 books, including Washington Bullets, Red Star Over the Third World, The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, and The Poor Nations, A Possible History of the Global South. For those who may know very little about the Tricontinental Institute, I will just give a brief introduction to its background and work. In January 1966, the Cuban people hosted the, tri uh, the Tricontinental, a conference of revolutionary movements from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. This conference had emerged from uh, two dynamics, states that emerged out of the anti-colonial movement that had by 1961 created the non-aligned movement or NAM, which included not only radical regimes, but also those with a more conciliatory attitude towards imperialism. Outside of NAM, there are movements with unfinished anti-colonial wars of national liberation, which had a more radical edge to them and which had been gathered together in 1957 in the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Organization, or the APSO. The NAM and APSO platforms often collaborated together and together they provided the cultural space from which the Tricontinental would emerge. At the Tricontinental Conference, the APSO was expanded into the organization of solidarity with the peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, or OSPAL, whose secretary continues to function in Havana in Cuba. It was also here that the tricontinental marked peace and socialism as the goal and whatever means would lead to this goal had to be utilized. From Havana, OSPAL provided the infrastructure for mutual understanding among the movements in the three continents. Today, it continues to produce the tricontinental magazine, which has become famous for its emblematic posters carrying the message of anti-colonial socialism. From these histories of both the NAM and OSPA came a series of important initiatives, many rooted in the United Nations. Some of these are intergovernmental organizations, such as the South Center based in Geneva, while others have little governmental support. What unites these initiatives is a commitment to the South, namely the countries that continue to struggle against the histories and structures of imperialism, but also to humanity in general. A genuinely South-based social and political philosophy must expand out from the South itself and embrace the world and its possibilities. OSPAL and the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research continue the heritage of the Tricontinental Conference and remain committed in their work towards building a world of peace and justice. The, Tricontin the Tricontinental stands, in the words of Franz Fanon, with the wretched of the earth to create a world of human beings. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Vijay Prasad for his lecture titled, Inter-Imperialist Rivalry and the Challenges Facing the Working Class Globally. 
Um, Alan, uh, a salute to the Communist Party of Ireland. It's no small feat to achieve a hundred years of existence <laughs> in a world committed to everything uh, that we don't stand for. That is to say, the world order is committed to money, it's committed to power, it's committed to privilege. We are committed to freedom, we are committed to emancipation, we are committed to the liberation of people, we are committed to the full freedom of humanity. Uh, this is something that the capitalists don't understand. Uh, they understand the words, but they don't understand their meaning. So it's a great honor to be here uh, to celebrate the 100 years of communism on the National Liberation uh, Island of Ireland. Uh, we always think of Ireland as part of the global anti-colonial struggle. Um, in 1916, when the Easter Rebellion took place, Vladimir Lenin, uh, reflecting on it, saw, in fact, that there was a very strong anti-colonial uh, quotient in the Easter Rising. It was not a rising within the block of imperialism, but it was a rising against imperialism. And the anti-imperialist currents of Irish um, emancipatory uh, politics is very strong and I'm very proud, proud to be associated uh, both with the I Communist Party of Ireland and of course the James Connolly, Co Connolly lecture because James Connolly, what a character, uh, what a character, you know, uh, a classic man of his era, like so many other of our comrades of that era, a true internationalist, you know, it was not enough for people like James Connolly to be uh, fixed on the liberation only of their homeland or of, of, of their country. Um, they saw the whole world as their homeland. They saw the entire working class as their class, uh, whether that working class was in India, whether that working class was in China, whether that working class was in the United States. For people like James Connolly, you know, uh, sitting, whether he's in Edinburgh or Dublin or in Troy, New York, for people like James Connolly, there is no parceled out working class. The workers of the world don't have a country. They don't have a country. They have a world to win. Uh, they understood that line from the Communist Manifesto uh, in their bones. So it's a great privilege to be associated as I said, not only with the history of communism in Ireland, the history of Irish anti-imperialism, but also in particular, um, the legacy of James Connolly uh, and may his legacy last into the next hundred years. So thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, it's a real privilege to be with you. Listen, uh, friends, I want to lay out something that's uh, not perhaps the best story to tell um, because I want to tell the story of our defeat and our weakness um, because I feel as Marxists, as human beings, uh, you can't build um, a struggle. We can't build our struggle if we don't acknowledge where we are. So I would like to give us a sense of where I think, where I think we are. Uh, and my thinking on this is not my personal uh, reading and so on, but it's the, the uh, assessment being built by the work of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. It's the assessment built by our movement partners in the International People's Assembly. It's the assessment built in the week of anti-imperialist struggle and so on. These are political platforms, hundreds of members in them, member organizations. Um, and it's this process that has helped me at least as, um, as an individual, but also as the director of the Institute it's helped me develop an assessment of our weakness and the necessity of uh, our role in the battle of ideas. So in the next period, I'm going to try to present that. I want to start precisely in our conjuncture, which is a conjuncture of political repression and the COVID pandemic. I want to start here first, then we'll do a little periodization of how we got here from a hundred years ago, when on the island of Ireland, um, communism uh, emerged out of the Socialist Party. I want to uh, go back and periodize for us the history of the left globally in the last hundred years and then suggest a way that we might want to think about uh, for the path forward. So that's the arc of what I'm going to do with you for the next 45-50 minutes. First, um, this is a difficult period. 
look at the political repression. If you are seeing images from Colombia uh, at the top of South America, governed by the right wing fascistic government of Ivan Duque, the uh, protege of Alvaro Uribe, uh, these are men committed to violence, committed to class power of the bourgeoisie, committed to imperialism. Um, they pushed through, Ivan Duque's government pushed through a bill which attempted to make the working class of Colombia pay for the cost of the pandemic. And this occasioned protests on the streets of Colombia, immense protests in Cali, in Medellin, in Bogota, and so on. And what the government of Colombia did is what the government of Colombia has done for 100 years. Um, famously, in 1948, during La, La Violencia, uh, famously in the assassination of one of the most important Colombian politicians in the 20th century, an assassination at that period uh, when Fidel Castro happened to be in uh, Bogota at a student meeting and there was again mass demonstrations. Uh, Colombia right now seeing repression against the people, um, extremely harsh repression and the hashtag out there is SOS Colombia. It's not being reported at all. Political repression just south of Colombia and Brazil, 25 people shot to death in a massacre yesterday by the Bra Brazilian security forces in their, in their favela. Um, went in to make some arrests, shot 25 people in cold blood as they came out surrendering. Political repression. If we go uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, we go to Jerusalem. What do we see in Jerusalem today? We see in Sheikh Jarrah, a neighborhood in East Palestine, East Palestine, part of the Palestinian uh, national home, uh, East Palestine, a part, uh, East Jerusalem, a part of Jerusalem, where the United States under Trump illegally moved its uh, its, its embassy. Israeli apartheid troops, by the way, the word apartheid now routinely used by a mainstream Western, often pro-imperialist human rights organizations, but earlier the UN Economic and Social Commission of West Asia already used the term apartheid in a report in 2014, then again in 2017. The apartheid troops in Israel entered um, Sheikh Jarrah, uh, shooting people, arresting people this morning, Friday, entered into the Al-Aqsa uh, Mosque, a sacred mosque for Muslims. Uh, the Israeli troops entered there. Uh, political repression to break the spirit of the Palestinian struggle, the Palestinian national struggle. Political repression, go down south to South Africa. In Durban, South Africa, Abba Khali base, Majondolo, the Shack Dwellers movement, its leaders in Durban arrested on a malicious charge, sitting right now in prison. George, who has no business being in prison, is sitting in prison. Political repression, cross the Indian Ocean, come to India now. There was an assembly election in four states and one union territory in the state of West Bengal, where I was born 54 years ago. Um, the ruling, the party that won, the Trinamul Congress, out there, post poll violence, going out there, killing and burning down offices of the opposition. The Communist Party of India, Marxist, of whom I am a member, uh, we are seeing our cadre politic face political repression from this organization, which is in power. Political repression, comrades, it is global, it is serious, we have to pay attention to it, we have to be in solidarity with every act of this kind of outrageousness on the one side. Secondly, this political repression is coming at a time of the COVID pandemic, a time of the COVID pandemic. When that COVID um, virus was first displayed for the first time, they saw it under a microscope in China. January 20th, 2020, first time they realized it's human to human transmission. China said, we've got to lock the Wuhan city down. We've got to lock Hubei province down. WHO on the 28th of January releases a set of, of, of statements when it says it's a public health emergency. It's only on March 11th, 2020 that they declare pandemic. But January 28th, they say it's a public health emergency. Poor socialist countries, poor socialist countries. I'm going to come back to this word poor in a few minutes. Poor socialist countries like Vietnam, like Laos and so on, which border China immediately took seriously um, the edict from the WHO.
promoted hand washing, promoted physical distancing, promoted mask wearing, promoted because they have a public sector, directed the public sector to create masks, directed the public sector to create hand sanitizer and so on. And largely these poor socialist projects of Vietnam and Laos largely broke the chain of the infection. The per capita infection rate in Vietnam and Laos should make political leaders in Europe, the United States, Brazil, India, it should make them sh ashamed of how they operated because they didn't take this virus seriously. They have contempt for humanity. I want you to take seriously the sentence I just said. They have contempt for humanity. They were mocking the virus when it first made its appearance, whereas Prime Minister Nguyen in Vietnam took it extremely seriously. He didn't mock it even for one minute, you know, despite um, what people say about uh, countries like Vietnam and Laos, you know, whatever the, the orientation in the West, people say, well, they are doing capitalism, whatever. These are socialist projects where the government is committed to the well-being of the people. They proved it in this pandemic. They used reason. They used pro-people policies. They put in place whatever public sector remains because it's a poor country. Whatever public sector remains, they put it to the service of people. They gave relief to people. They offered relief to people. They didn't say, you know, you're on your own. Uh, they used whatever resources were possible. It's not always material resources. Sometimes it's solidarity in neighborhoods, community organizations, and so on. Very important how they dealt with the COVID catastrophe. It's quite different than how it was dealt with in the advanced capitalist countries or the bourgeois democracies, where it was a catastrophe, a total catastrophe. No rational policy, no public sector, public health care eviscerated. In India, the government shamefully spends 1.3% of GDP on public, on, on health care, on health care. 1.3% of GDP is the government expenditure on health care. That is outrageously low, abysmally low, which is why in India, the third wave, second wave, fourth wave, what does it matter? It has been a catastrophic display in India right now of the condition of people. Uh, queues waiting to get into hospitals, oxygen, medical oxygen running out, queues at crematoria and so on, because there was no public sector that was told get to work. There was just pleas to the private sector. The private sector's interest is profit, not the society, not humanity. Uh, capitalism structurally has contempt for humanity. It only has um, concern for profit. It has contempt for humanity. When will we be able to drive an agenda, a social agenda, to get uh, enough mass support behind the idea that capitalism has contempt for humanity, that only the socialist project lifts up humanity to its maximum potential? This has been proven in this pandemic as we watched countries like Brazil, India, the United States, United Kingdom, and so on collapse under the weight, not of this pandemic, under the weight of their own rotten structures. The pandemic was the little push. The structure was already rotten because the pandemic also tried to push at Vietnam. The pandemic also tried to push at Laos. The pandemic also tried to push at Cuba, did not succeed because in these countries, the socialist projects have not contempt for humanity, but they want to uplift the possibilities of humanity. It's a very important thing I'm, I want to please emphasize that the pandemic hasn't created these problems. The pandemic has revealed the problem. The problem is deeper than the pandemic. The problem is the rot in the structure of capitalism. What is that rot? That rot is for the last 50 odd years, at least the advanced capitalist countries through privatization and austerity politics have essentially hollowed out the state system and have destroyed the capacity of society to stand up for itself. They've destroyed the capacity of mutual aid and so on. This is important because in the socialist countries, in the socialist projects, places of great poverty, lack of resources and so on, great poverty, lack of resources, some of them under immense imperialist embargo, such as Cuba, such as Venezuela, despite all that, the commitment to humanity, the commitment to spending um, public resources, social wealth 
on building up social infrastructure, public infrastructure, that commitment has demonstrated the validity of the idea that socialism is far, far superior to the capitalist project. The capitalist project could produce an abundance of goods. It can produce an abundance of goods, but it produces scarcity of access. When you're walking down the high streets in Ireland or you walk down the high streets in any of these advanced capitalist countries, you will see shop windows filled with goods. There is an abundance of goods, but there is a scarcity of access because people don't have money in their pocket. What capitalism is good at is producing an abundance of goods, certain kinds of goods, mind you. In a pandemic, just when you need masks, when you need vaccines and so on, they just can't do it. Nonetheless, they produce an abundance of goods. What they don't produce, what they produce on the other side is a scarcity of access. People cannot access these goods. What the socialist experiments in the USSR, in Eastern Europe demonstrated to us is there may not be an abundance of goods. There might even be a scarcity of goods. And I'm going to come back to this idea of poverty and scarcity. There might be a scarcity of goods, but comrades, friends, there was an abundance of concern for humanity. There was an abundance of concern for humanity. And that's the dividing line between the capitalist project and the socialist project. The socialist project has to struggle to create an abundance of goods. I'm going to come back to that, as I said. But nonetheless, there is an abundance of care for humanity. In the capitalist project, abundance of goods, scarcity of concern for humanity. That has been demonstrated by this pandemic. At the end, I'm going to come back if there's time to vaccines, but I want to move forward. That's where we are. And we are weak. We are not strong. Um, we don't have the capacity to drive an agenda. Look how quickly in this period, um, the capitalist media is able to you know, say that, look how well Boris Johnson is doing in the United Kingdom with the vaccine rollout. And look how well he's doing, and therefore then they can drive a political agenda. Uh, they can win, you know, I learned these English places during elections. They can win the election in Hartlepool. I say it as if I know it well, but then again, I know more about the details of an English election than most people know about the election coming in Peru where our comrade Pedro Castillo, a genuine left-wing comrade from Peru Libre, is going to run against Madam Fujimori of the far right. Um, I hope you will follow closely the election in Peru. Follow it more closely than people follow these elections in the United Kingdom. It is interesting how imperialist information works. You know, we are so interested in what's going to happen in election in Europe or in the United States, but um, elections in the global south, one pays less attention. In November of this year in Chile, there will be a presidential election where a communist candidate, Daniel Hadwe, is going to be uh, leading the left into the ballot. He will be the left candidate against the right. It's a two-person uh, race, most likely. And we'll have a communist running in, in, in Chile, as we have a communist running in Peru in the, in the form of Pedro Castillo. We're in a difficult situation. We can't drive an agenda. That's the first point. I mean, despite the gains in Laos and Vietnam, people will be rolling their eyes. Even some of you listening to this will roll your eyes and say, well, those are poor countries. Let's come to that immediately. Look at the history of our socialism. 100 years of Irish communism. Let's look at the history of our socialism. There was not one socialist revolution in an advanced industrial country. Not one. Where were the socialist revolutions? The October Revolution of 1917, which inspired the whole world, took place inside the Tsarist Empire, the wretchedly poor, largely peasant Tsarist Empire, a revolution led by women workers, by the working class of one small section of the Tsarist Empire, but joined eventually by peasants, by national liberation struggles from Central Asia, from Dagestan, from Armenia, from Azerbaijan, and so on. Very complicated revolutionary process, but not an advanced industrial society. The next revolution was Mongolia in 1919. You know, that was the second revolution. Uh, then we cross over and we see a revolution in Vietnam in 1945, which eventually triumphed, the second major triumph in 1975. Then we see a revolution in China. China, China faced a World War II comrades that starts in 1937 
uh, long before the European war lasts up to 1949. That's a 12-year war that the Chinese people face, wretchedly poor when the revolution triumphs in 1949. When Mao and the comrades enter the Forbidden City in Tiananmen Square in 1949, they have inherited governance of an incredibly poor country. During that war, war Chiang Kai-shek flooded two districts of China in order to prevent the advance of the Japanese army, killing God knows untold million people maybe, we don't know, destroying agriculture in central, in central China. Uh, a wretchedly poor country in 1949. Then Cuba, 59, a country suffocated by US imperialism since at least 1898. Um, revolution in 1959 immediately embargoed. None of these revolutions take place in an advanced industrial country. You know, what had been anticipated in the Marxist theory. And the reason uh, we have uh, this idea of Marxist Leninism as our general orientation is because of very interesting contribution made by Lenin on this particular point. Lenin argued that imperialism, the imperialist system, prevents colonized parts of the world from advancing their productive forces for developing capitalism. So if you tell colonized places, say India or China or so on, in the 1900s, if you told them from the standpoint, say, of the Second International, from the Socialist International, you said to them, look, you can't advance. You have to all, all of you lefties, you have to become promoters of capitalism. First, you have to promote capitalism and then eventually you'll have socialism, the so-called stage theory. Lenin rejected this. He said these areas of the world will never promote their productive forces because they are under the grip of imperialism. Therefore, the task of the left in these countries is twofold. First, advance the national struggle, advance national liberation, get rid of colonialism. Then when you come into power, you have to both develop the productive forces because you are a wretchedly poor country and you can't socialize poverty. You have to advance the productive forces and you have to socialize the wealth. You have to transform the social relations. You have to experiment with cooperatives. You have to experiment with new forms of socialist democracy and so on. The task inside the third world, inside the national liberation zones of the world, very complicated. This was the real thrust of Leninism in his text from 1915, the right of nations to self-determination and so on. That's why when the Easter Rising took place in Ireland, Lenin immediately supported it, unlike other members of the what would later become the Bolshevik party, including Trotsky, who opposed the Easter Rising. Lenin immediately supported the Easter Rising because he had this understanding of how you had to have in the colonized parts of the world a dual agenda, advance the productive forces, overthrow the colonial political rule, and then socialize production and then at the same time advance this it's not in a stage process um why am i getting into all this because i want to say that today's socialist experiments are all taking place in extremely poor countries that are essentially following a leninist path this is something that's also there in china in china as well there's a zigzag approach to what they're doing it's a ridiculous kind of uh, you know kind of papal approach that some Marxists take about countries around the world. They want a kind of papal litmus test. Is it capitalist? Is it socialist? You know, bring out your litmus paper and put it to the country and say, what does it show? Does it show? Ca this is too uh, rigid a way to approach the world. It's not dialectical. We need to understand Vietnam for what it is. You know, Vietnam is a country bombed by the United States, used chemical weapons. If you walk down what used to be the Ho Chi Minh Trail, that whole area's agriculture has been destroyed. We'll be not able to recover for generations. How do you expect a country like that so quickly to become some kind of paradise? They are on a socialist project with great perils and some possibilities. Same China, it's great perils, some possibilities. They've been able to advance the productive forces considerably, but now they are struggling to socialize production, to transform uh, you know, certain kinds of values and so on. It's a big fight. Uh, that's what the project of Xi Jinping is all about and so on. There's no advanced industrial country that had a revolution. 
And therefore, we have these countries penalized for their poverty, the historical poverty, the historical, uh, you know, place in the international division of labor as colonies or as semi colonies. They're penalized. Socialism is penalized. People in the West will say, what kind of socialism is that? I don't want to be living in Venezuela. Living in Venezuela, comrades, it's a poor country, which for many years was under the uh, hold of imperialism. Uh, under Chavez, they break out of that system, then come under immense sanctions regime, immense hybrid war against Venezuela, struggling to maintain the dynamic of the Venezuelan Bolivarian revolution. And of course, people glibly can dismiss it and say, well, Maduro is this, Maduro is that. Maduro is this. Maduro did not attack Iraq. Maduro did not destroy Libya. Maduro did not destroy Afghanistan. Um, Nicolas Maduro is a former bus driver, trade union leader, trying to hold together a process, very complicated process. I want to put this on the table because I want to suggest that part of our weakness is our inability to look at actually historically developing socialist projects for what they are, rather than to judge them again from this papal standpoint. The weakness of our movement, excuse me, the weakness of our movement is the inability of our movement to have solidarity with actual existing projects of socialist experimentation in the world, whether it's Cuba, it's China, it's Vietnam, it's Venezuela, or it's the Indian state of Kerala, where our comrades just won re-election. The first time the left has been re-elected in Kerala, a state of 35 million people with an enormous mandate, 99 seats in a 140 seat assembly. It's a huge triumph for the people of Kerala. But the failure to have a kind of solidarity, and I don't mean blind solidarity, a kind of solidarity with actually existing social ex experiments and lift up the way in which these socialist countries have been or projects have been able to um, you know, prevent the wholesale catastrophe in their countries during the COVID crisis, that failure is going to be a missed opportunity for the global left. The global left must lift up those experiments and those attempts at dealing with the COVID catastrophe in a, huma in a humane way, in a way where humanity is privileged over profit. So that point I want to put out there. Now, it is, of course, true that we are in a position of weakness. Uh, even if we do lift up these experiments, we are in a position of weakness because every one of our socialist government projects and mass projects is under attack one place or the other. I started by saying political repression. That's against our movements, not against our governments. Against our movements, our comrades, whether they're in Colombia, South Africa or West Bengal are under attack. Our movements are under attack. That's the first point. Secondly, our governments, the socialistic projects are under attack, whether it's the um, hybrid war against Venezuela, Cuba and so on, or it's the new Cold War against China. These socialist projects are under attack. And I'm going to come back to the socialist projects again in a second. They are under attack. Solidarity with them is important. Uh, disavowal of them is a disavowal of ourselves. You know, the independent left that always says, well, I'm for the left, but I, I have problems with them. That's fine. You can have problems, but are you in solidarity in one way or the other? Um, because imperialism doesn't care about your opinion, your doubts and so on. Um, imperialism right now is an aligned struggle against you and you standing apart and saying, well, I'm not that keen on them or I have some aesthetic problems with them or whatever. That's fine. Uh, but I want you also to check your own privileges when you uh, sitting in, say, in the Northern Bloc, um, are critical of an experiment in socialism taking place in Laos, you know, um, even perhaps mocking it. These are extraordinarily poor countries attempting a very complicated socialist transition, which is not even being attempted in your own countries, and yet you're judging them. Uh, when the Italian communists went to visit Ho Chi Minh in the late 1960s, uh, they sat down and talked to him, and the comrades from Italy said to Ho Chi Minh, in a very comradely spirit, they asked him, what can we do to help the Vietnamese Revolution. And Comrade Ho Chi Minh, one of the great uh, geniuses of the 20th century, and I, I would like to let you know that later this year, Leftward Books is going to uh, release Selected Ho Chi Minh. I've been editing this book forever, but it will come out soon with some new writings. Comrade Ho Chi Minh turns to the Italian comrades and he says to them, 
you want to help the Vietnamese revolution, there is only one way. Go back home and make a revolution. Go back home and make a revolution. It's, I think, important. Um, solidarity with other experiments is useful, but also building our own struggles is important. Now, quickly to pivot. We are in a position of immense weakness. Uh, it's hard for us to exaggerate our forces. You know, there may be mass demonstrations here, there, and everywhere. We might have some electoral breakthrough, but we are in a position of weakness. Look at Spain recently, where in the Madrid elections, the right-wing candidate put forward a slogan, communism or liberty. Uh, she's making the claim that communism is antithetical to liberty and the left led by people like Pablo Iglesias, by, by the Communist Party of Spain and others could not advance uh, to uh, push that slogan aside, to say that slogan is ridiculous. In fact, that slogan is rooted in, 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 in the fascism of Franco. Um, couldn't do it, were defeated. The right one, the Francoist right one in Madrid. Let's acknowledge that. Uh, this is where we are. We are trying to build our political strength from the ground up, but we need some other kind of uh, analysis as well. So I wanted to say I'm going to pivot to this point, which is about how to create cracks in the structure of imperialism. You know, how to create those cracks. We have to build our strength from below. We have to build solidarity with the socialist projects that exist in the world. Those two things I've established already. Now, cracks in the structure. Um, you see, there is no need to fantasize about, let's say, a socialist bloc emerging, like there was one in the immediate aftermath of World War II. There is no socialist bloc led by the People's Republic of China that's going to confront imperialism. The Chinese government is not interested. The Communist Party in China is not interested in a direct confrontation with the United States. That's not the, the assessment right now. They understand that the US government, US power is unmatched in terms of its military capacity, its capacity to bomb any country. It's unmatched in terms of the uh, control the United States has on the world economy, both through um, the use of the dollar as the reconciliation currency between countries and of course through the systems of credit and the movement of money systems of credit means the whole banking industry which to some extent is 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 governed by um, you know uh, the u.s treasury department whether it goes through the international monetary fund or it goes through the paris group the london group and so on of, of creditors u.s treasury department plays a big role in the move in in the in the movement of money and also actually movement of money through the swift network uh, based in the European Union, which actually facilitates the, the real transfer of money. All of this stuff gives the United States an outsized uh, control over the world economy, over world politics. Nobody should be, um, you know, misled into imagining there's a decline of the United States, comrades. You know, I'm 100% against US imperialism, but I'm also not an illusionist. I don't believe that the United States is just going to vanish from the planet as a major power. I have much more respect for the Chinese analysis. I think it's correct. U.S. imperialism continues to be powerful and will be powerful for some time yet. Nonetheless, there are cracks in the armor. That's what I want to get into. There are two particular platforms that go forward, and I want to spend a few minutes on them. One is the platform of multipolarity, and the second is the platform of regionalism. I want to expand on these. You see, gone is the time when we had um, a socialist bloc, Soviet Union, China, you know, the socialist countries in, in Eastern Europe and so on. They provided a kind of shield in international institutions. They provided a mechanism uh, for national liberation organizations and governments to survive. Nobody uh, really was misled by the importance of the USSR. Uh, this was there in the formation um, 60 years ago, this September of the non-aligned movement in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. This was there at the meeting of the Tricontinental, with, which Alan referenced in 1966 in Havana, Cuba. Um, this was there in the 1973-74 New International Economic Order text. And, and by the way, in 1960, when the UN General Assembly um, was beginning to discuss decolonization, the USSR put the first resolution on the table, uh, which became the historic 1960 UN resolution on decolonization. 
the first draft of that resolution was tabled by the USSR. There's no doubt that in that period there was that block. There was no doubt that in that period there was the block of the third world project, um, the block of national populism, of you know uh, national democratic bourgeois governments, whether it's the government in India, the government in Indonesia, both of them with some left uh, content in the government, but nonetheless, the national bourgeoisie in those countries had a nationalist populist kind of, of, of content. Um, you know, this was the case in Egypt, for instance, uh, in the time of Nasser, there was a national populist uh, kind of, uh, of, of agenda. There was a character, democratic bourgeois character, um, you know, nationalist bourgeoisie and so on. This was there in that period, immediate after the Second World War, you had the, the great block of, of, of socialism, you had the Third World blo block. These two play an important role in trying to advance an agenda. This agenda collapses in the 1980s as a consequence of um, the eventual uh, you know, dismantling, the surrender of Gorbachev and his clique of the USSR, the destruction of Eastern European socialism. Uh, this uh, period ends with the collapse of the Third World Project. Third World Project collapses externally through the induced debt crisis, the Third World debt crisis, but also internally as the class dynamics inside these countries changes, as the ruling class basically uh, quits, uh, resigns from its national populist uh, agenda and shifts to being subordinate allies of imperialism. This is nowhere clearer than in India where the Indian bourgeoisie loses, empties out, vacates its national uh, populist character completely, uh, vacates its legacy of, of, uh, of the independent struggle and so on, and inhabits now a subordinate character to imperialism. Uh, that is clear. That happens from the 1980s onwards. You see the socialist bloc dissolved. You see the national bourgeoisie in countries like Egypt, India, and so on, formally um, the bulwarks of non-aligned policy, the bulwarks of the non-aligned movement will quit the field and will go and stand in the second row behind the United States president. This is clarified during the era of globalization from the 90s onwards. So the reason I'm saying all this is now we are at a period of great fracturedness where there is no real so socialist bloc and the national populist uh, agenda is not there. Therefore, we have two other platforms before us today. And those are the two I want to emphasize. The first is multipolarity. From the 1990s onward, um, the Chinese government, for instance, and the Communist Party in China has put forward the view that China does not want to directly confront anybody, let alone the United States, but it would like to see the development of a multipolar world of a world of multilateral organizations and of a multipolar sensibility, not that there is one block that dominates everything in the world. This was a very interesting opening. It's shared by many countries around the world. It's out of this multipolar sensibility that you get in 2003 at Cancun, at a, a meeting in Cancun on trade and development, you get India, South Africa, and Brazil coming together, these three large countries coming together to buck the system, to stand apart from the intellectual property rules on pharmaceuticals. They are thinking in particular on AIDS drugs and they create a block. They want to create a pole of the global south where they'll have a different agenda towards intellectual property and pharmaceuticals and they succeed because India is able to produce off patent pharmaceutical drugs, particularly the AIDS cocktail for markets in the African continent, in South America, and so on. That was very important. That becomes the basis for the creation in 2009 of BRICS, when Russia and China will join India, Brazil, and South Africa. That was an attempt at multipolarity. It fell apart when the class character of the Indian and Brazilian governments changes. When the right comes to power in these countries, the BRICS basically, to some extent, dissolves. It still exists, but it's not what it was. But these are all experiments in multipolarity. The, the, the Chinese have been leading in this to create a different pole with their new strategic alignment with Russia. This is important, the Russia-China alliance, settling the old boundary dispute from the 1950s, incre increasing military and commercial trade, and so on. 
um, this has changed the character of the um, both Russia and Chinese foreign policy. They understand themselves as constituting a pole in a multipolar landscape, having through the brick and road initiative and so on, and Russia's old foreign policy relationships, creating um, a new kind of, of a framework for countries, providing them with an alternative uh, with the wealth of China and the military capacity of Russia, constituting a separate pole, not a pole in direct confrontation with the United States, but nonetheless a multipolar uh, landscape. Now, this is an important point. Neither Russia nor China are actually inviting a contest with the United States. They are trying to get to use their power, consolidate their power in a defensive way. They want to prevent a U.S. imposition of conflict on them. The Russians have made this clear as well on several occasions. They are not inviting a contest with the, Rus with the United States. Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which was to circumvent uh, Ukraine in particular, go through the Baltics into Germany. The point of that wasn't to intensify a conflict with the West, but to try to say, let's continue trade relations. Let, let's continue economic relations. You do your things your way. We do our, things our way. Okay. One may, will have a million problems with the government in Russia, but the point is they are not standing and saying we are the beacon of the future. They merely want to constitute multipolarity. And I think this is an important direction for the, for the left. Um, while we build our ranks, while we consolidate our ideological clarity, it's very important to support um, the emergence of multipolarity, to see uh, forces grow up uh, to confront not uh, the United States frontally, but to say we want to confront a unipolar world. We want to confront the dictation to governments all over the world with how they should govern themselves. You know, what was called the structural adjustment policies of the IMF and so on. Set that aside. Now we want to have our own thinking. As a consequence of the emergence of multipolarity, the second platform uh, perhaps will reveal itself to be more realistic. And that's the platform of regionalism. You see, you already have in the period of uh, the commodity boom, the so-called pink tide in South America, you already saw uh, Hugo Chavez drive a policy of regionalism in South America with the creation of ALBA, the Bolivarian areas of the Americas. They fought off the free trade areas of the Americas, created their own thing. Um, they created UNASUR, they created Banco Sur, which is the Bank of the South. They created a virtual currency, the Sucre, to reconcile internal trade in, in Latin America. They created Telesur as a, techno, as a communications platform and so on to, to confront CNN, Espanol, and, 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 and other companies like that. Um, this was an attempt at regionalism. The United States, when they went after Venezuela, it was to go after this regionalist project. So when we have a multipolar content, when multipolarity becomes clarified, when it's able to assert itself, at that point, regionalism will become more practical, more possible. Uh, we'll see something like the African Union, which right now struggles to maintain um, its legitimacy. Remember, during the NATO-imposed war on Libya, the African Union's Peace and Security Council had deliberated about that war that was to come. This is in already in late February, early March and had a plain load of negotiators sitting in an airport in Mauritania, ready to fly to Tripoli to negotiate with Muammar Gaddafi. And before the plane, the African Union negotiated plane, which the French knew was sitting there, the United States knew, before it could take off to try a mission of uh, diplomacy and dialogue with the Gaddafi government, before they could even take off, the French bombed Libya. Um, they have undermined regionalism in Africa consistently. Um, the African Union's Peace and Security Council recently, just a few years ago, passed a resolution against military bases on the continent. There are 55 countries on the African continent. The United States has military bases in 20 of them. In Agadez, Niger, it has the largest drone base in the world, which most people have never heard of. In Arlit, in Niger, the French have garrisoned that town because it's the town that produces yellow cake uranium. This is imperialism on steroids, and they are not allowing the regional process called the African Union uh, to assert itself. But if multipolarity increases, comrades, if multipolarity is strengthened, 
at that point the possibility for regionalism will increase if the possibility for regionalism will increase then our struggles can germinate and become stronger trade unionism in africa can pick up uh, left struggles will be able to survive without immense political repression because today there is no ability to advance struggles easily no ability to advance struggles easily in zambia our comrade fred medembe of the socialist party of zambia running for president this year experiencing immense repression in that political campaign um, it's hard to even know that fred is running for president in zambia because the imperialist media completely blockades this if we have more multipolarity if we have more regionalism we may have the capacity to transmit information around the lines of control that are right now established by the capitalist press um, so these two platforms first um, you know the emergence of multipolarity has to be promoted in order for that to be promoted we have to stand up against this cold war imposed on china right now an information war a war that uh, in, involves trade a war that involves diplomacy i mean think about just the information war aspect of this it's the last colonial governor in Hong Kong, Chris Patton, who's lecturing the Chinese about democracy in Hong Kong. A colonial administrator, when the British held Hong Kong for about 100 years, not one day did they advance democratic processes in that island. But after they've left and Hong Kong returns to uh, China, then they will lecture them about democracy. And, and people around the world take this seriously. You know, they, they assume Chris Patton is an expert on Hong Kong. He was the last colonial administrator. Have we lost our minds? Have we lost our minds? No, we've given it up to the unipolarity of information networks. We've given it up to imperialist information networks which suffocate all other thinking. Therefore, standing against this new cold war against China is what is going to allow multipolarity to assert itself. We have to help develop multipolarity multipolarity does not mean that we are saying that you know countries that will emerge as the other significant poles are somehow the bastions of socialism no no socialism is a process this is a step in that process advance the cause of multipolarity second political objective is develop and protect and support regionalism very important that we support institutions like the bolivarian areas of the america alba very important that we advance try to drive a left agenda in the african union very important that we drive regionalist policies particularly in the global south um, think about the vaccine question in africa in um, uh, south america the capacity to produce vaccines is not there it's not a question only of the patent wave waiver at the un at, at the wto and i could have gone on to that but i don't want to get into detail the question is not just the waiver but the production capacity has atrophied as a consequence of IMF pressure on these countries to cut public sector in pharmaceutical production. You know, that's played a very important role here. So if you have good, strong regional entities, you might create regional production capacity for pharmaceutical companies, you see, uh, for pharmaceutical industry. Can you imagine in, say, the Horn of Africa, um, a regional consortium develops so that countries in the region have a joint capacity to produce vaccines, drugs, and so on. Look, this COVID-19 is not the first, nor will it be the last healthcare emergency or pandemic. Um, you know, in fact, we should, like we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, we should create an intergovernmental panel on health crises because more will come. For that, we need to develop regional pharmaceutical uh, production lines and to have that you need a political process of regionalism you can't have production processes regionally without a political process that comes before it so the advancement of a political regionalism has immediate relief um, on the table for people that's why it's not just some uh, utopic idea you know it, it has an actual content right there right in front of it um, so that's what I'm uh, trying to establish is that we are in a position of some um, weakness in our struggles. We have on the one side um, a political repression against our movements globally. Solidarity for our movements is essential. Standing up now for the comrades in Colombia is essential. Um, we have 
are uh, various socialist governmental projects under attack one after the other by the imperialist bloc. I think this uh, casual kind of uh, remark one sees among leftists who say, well, I don't like this socialist project, don't like that. That's all, all very well, comrades, but you have to stand up against the imperialist attack on these projects. That I think should be established. That should be a point of unity. So these two things being given, this establishes our weakness in a sense on the global stage. To advance out of weakness, there are three points. One, we have to promote multipolarity because that is going to allow, in some measure, the imperialist suffocation of the world to be, um, you know, to be uh, prevented. Secondly, we have to promote regionalism. It's very important because regional structures need to be created, can't be on a national basis. And third, we have to advance our own political strength organize the key classes, the working class, the peasantry, and so on. These three aspects are the three political directions uh, for us now at this conjuncture, at this point. Um, this is a tough period, comrades. We are nowhere near emerging out of our political weakness. First, we are nowhere near emerging out of this crisis. India will not vaccinate uh, its population till the end of 2022. We are right now in 2021. We will not finish vaccinating till end of 2022. Uh, bear that in mind. We're not nearly out of the COVID catastrophe. We're certainly not nearly out of the capitalist catastrophe. Uh, we have to be patient. We have to be strong, but we also have to be clear, which is why promotion of multipolarity, promotion of regionalism, and building an independent working class and peasant strength is essential. There's no other way. Um, there is no other way for humanity to survive than to survive into a socialist project. Can't continue with the capitalist project. It is totally moribund. Can't continue in this project. Um, you want to carry forward the legacy of James Connolly? You want to carry forward the legacy of the Irish left? This is the only way, comrades. There's no other way. I would like to sit someday outside that post office in Dublin and talk to the ghost of James Connolly and ask him, what's the way forward? And I bet you there would be not much disagreement. I bet you. Uh, in honor of James Connolly, then let's commit ourselves to advancing, advancing these goals. Let's commit ourselves to promoting at least the socialist path, uh, if not socialism totally in our lifetimes. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, VJ. That was great. I think um, everyone watching will agree with me. I loved your line about the um, that, that that sometimes there's there might be a scarcity of goods in socialist states, but an abundance of concern for humanity. Whereas in the capitalist states, then we have the opposite: uh, overabundance of good and the scarcity of humanity. I'm just going to uh, finish off uh, this event with um, a few notes. I want to thank everyone um, who's contributed to the. Uh, James Connolly Festival this year and making it the success it has been. Especially want to thank uh, those who uh, those of you who have donated to the festival and especially some trade unions who have made some generous donations, which I will mention now. So I'd like to thank INTO, um, ESU, uh, UNITE, the, the DES uh, bonus branch, CWU, NIPSA and SIP2. This talk and all the other talks will be available on the Socialist Voice YouTube channel, so please go check that out. I know I will think we return to this particular talk myself for sure. Um, there are a number of events still to come, including our annual James Connolly commemoration in Arbor Hill Military Cemetery tomorrow, um, Sunday the 9th of May. And as has been a tradition over the last number of years, for any of the, uh, you, you who want to uh, follow on with the ideas that were discussed during this week, we will hold uh, the Connolly Conversations and they'll run over the next four Saturdays online on Zoom, of course. And if you would like to find out any more about the Connolly Conversations, you just have to send an email to cpofireland at gmail.com. And finally, there will be a solidarity picket for the end of the narco state killings in Colombia. This will be held at the Colombian uh, Embassy in 19 Raglan Road, Dublin 2, on Tuesday, the 11th of May at 1 p.m. This will be a socially distant event, so please wear a mask. So, Carmen, thanks so much, and thanks again to Vijay Bersad for that wonderful lecture. Stay safe. Thanks a lot.